one of the boys asked my son, what does your mom do? And he said, she saves Mustangs. The first time that you ever saw these Mustangs, describe the thing that popped into your brain. They are the Earth's most beautiful, incredible creatures. So important to keep these animals wild and protect them. Sonia Spaziani, or Mustang Meg, as she's known across social media, has been tracking and advocating for wild mustangs and burros in Oregon Steens Mountains since 1994. Her dedication and inspiring photographs have increased awareness and helped begin to spur better protections for our wild horses and burros and the ranges they roam. She's a true difference maker, a level-headed centrist respected by all sides involved in the current unacceptable plight of Mustangs. Instead of humanely being managed on the range, thousands are being rounded up and unnecessarily warehoused and even sold off at a huge expense to taxpayers. We traveled through miles and miles of the open range today. The most epic experience of my life. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Yeah. So the shallow's in the very front seat. Her yes, long mane. Yes. Oh my goodness, I just love her. How do you find these horses? Because we certainly did. So how do you explain how you find the horses? Mostly it's knowing these bands and the stallions. They have certain territories, but also after doing this for so many years, there's a certain feeling. It's a Mustang radar. Well, there's your first official Mustangs right there. It's like you can absorb their wild and you come home just recharged and refreshed. So after three decades of following these horses around, do you believe you're actually part Mustang? <laughs> <laughs> my, my husband says so. It's like every time she comes back, she's more Mustang. I love so. that. In what way? Uh, just, uh, you know, freer, freer in thought, uh, freer from constraints of society just more interested in following the natural progression of life, I guess, and not stressing the stuff that kind of keeps a person in a box, you know, that, that a lot of people have been experiencing. And it makes you think in terms of a Mustang and that's freedom and, and living to live and loving your family, but basically bottom line. We need to make that into a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> the Mustangs that we visit tend to be um, a lot of Pinto, and they're very distinguishable from miles away. We can establish bands. An average band is about seven, eight horses. Sometimes the bands congregate into a herd, and it's been wonderful following them for a number of years now. And is it a mixture of stallions and mares and babies or, or describe that? It's every stallion's goal to be the sole stallion. And typically since childhood, we have learned that it's one stallion to every mare, but we have found through our many years of following these horses, it could be the one stallion, but then he'll have lieutenants or other stallions trailing the herd in hopes that one stallion will be overthrown or they can pick off mares. But typically the strongest will prevail which is the amazing thing about wild horse society is that um, the strongest will procreate the next generation for better and stronger Mustangs. Oh, look at them right there. So what struck me immediately when I saw these animals was that they look so incredibly healthy. And I, you know, I guess I wasn't really expecting that. How does the range affect them? It seems like they're in their perfect environment here. They really are. They basically have everything that they need. And what makes a Mustang is the strife, the good and the bad that comes with the environment, the different seasons. But they also know when it's the fall season that they'll spend more time grazing, for instance, and um, get ready for the harsh winter season, which is no growth. And they just have to sustain on what is available. But basically, they have everything they need. I mean, there was no evidence of any kind of parasites or worms, and, and that really struck me. So how in the world do these animals stay parasite-free in this environment? It's been wonderful to learn on this journey, and uh, they will nibble along the sagebrush, which we have plenty. It's dotted across the whole country, and it's a natural dewormer. We have never, in the years and years that we've been out here, come across anything that would cause an alarm for parasites. So tell me the first time you ever saw a wild Mustang. Oh gosh, uh, 
1994, my husband and I were driving just back dirt road and they just happened to, this is before I even realized that there were, that there were Mustangs. Um, I heard that there were some like in the West and I didn't think that I'd be so lucky to have them in my own state, but we went out to this country, to this part of the country in Southeast Oregon to just be out in the, in the remote wilderness. And just by chance, just a herd of about 40 horses, several bands probably went running right across this dirt road, dust everywhere. I mean, dust on our lips. We could, in that, in that sense, kind of taste them, you know, and all these colors flashed before our eyes. Um, horses of different sizes and ages and colors and mamas and papas and babies and elders. And that's when it just kind of clicked. It's like, oh my goodness, I need to know everything I can about them. So you were hooked from that moment on. So you just started doing research on them and, yes. and started researching, understanding 2004, around the time of the Burns Amendment that changed to the Wild Horse Act, Wild Horse and Burrow Act that we had. It got my attention because that put tens of thousands of horses at risk. So even though they were on these protected lands, the Burns Amendment of 2004, signed by George W. Bush, allowed for horses over 10, even on these protected HMAs, and horses that have been passed over uh, by adoption, the three strikes rule, three times, were subject uh, for um, sales without limitations. That got my attention that they would change that and, and probably how it happened. I think that was probably the worst part of it, that it happened during the holidays and not a lot of uh, public feedback or knowledge. And I started following the American Wild Horse Preservation Campaign. They have a lot of really good information about uh, a lot of the past history and everything. And then of course, 2008, I got more digital cameras and started becoming more interested, developing a page with the Mustang Meg and then getting my friends out there in 2011 to actually start tracking these horses. And here we are today, 10 years later. You can see why this is called the Yellow Boy Band. There's Duns and Palomino's mostly yellow looking horses. All our lives, my sister and I always heard my dad say, never take freedom for granted. And so that's been really drilled in, in our heads. So working with the Mustangs, being around the Mustangs, it's interesting how that kind of fed into that. And it's like, yes, this is what freedom truly, truly feels like. So is that why you, you feel so strongly about these Mustangs? being able to keep their freedom? Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Especially when we study the families, research the families, we photo document the families from when, I mean, we've had babies that have grown up to be massive, incredible stallions or beautiful mares that it just, it's just fascinating. And then even generations after that, it's, it's just, it's fantastic. You, you can sense that freedom. You can sense their need and desire for freedom and just being as family units and just following that, that Mustang society. Where did you grow up? Tell me about your childhood. Uh, I was born in the Czech Republic in 1967. And my dad had a dream to live in the United States as a rancher and a cowboy. So he wanted that kind of way of life. And his country was so oppressed that he snuck Western novels about the cowboy. And that intrigued him. And so he would read by flashlight or whatever means under his blanket when he was supposed to be asleep about the, the rancher and the cowboy. And he decided, he, well, he didn't want to live in an in, in oppressed land and made up this uh, story to get his family out. And in 1968, the Russians were taking over. So it was his opportunity to, uh, with the chaos that was going on in the country, to take his family out. And so he, did, he I think, established a uh, plan uh, a story about vacationing at somebody like a, a relative's house or something like that. So he packed his wife and two daughters and um, headed across the border. It, to this day, I, I've heard the stories that I was the heroine because I was only uh, the little 13 month old baby with, um, and they weren't disposable diapers, but it was very, you know, ripe in the car. And so he went to the, to the guard station and they, they just, they opened the car door and then they just waved them on. Okay, just go, <laughs> just go. So I hear that story with the family dinners a lot, but 
Anyway, so he got contacts and was able to leave the country. I think he went to Germany, then Chicago. And uh, he's one of those people, the old school people that would work above and beyond what, what was expected. And so he climbed through his career and then um, moved down to Los Angeles. From there, I was old enough where I got settled into the horses and discovered that horses were all I ever wanted to do and be. And and so I helped him and I worked hard to find a ranch up here in Oregon. And we did the, just that and we moved up here and, and uh, it, the story continued from there. After doing this work for so long, do you think when you go out there, do you think they recognize you? Do you think you have that bond with any of them? I hope so. I, I don't know, but I do know the horses that see us will see them pick up their heads and they go, oh, it's, it's them. Okay. I, I mean, it kind of feels like that. And then they go back to grazing. Alice and a handful of friends and I think that feels like possible recognition. We try not to talk to them or when we photograph, we try not to change anything they would naturally do. We kind of stay a little bit more back just to observe their behaviors and whatnot. But it seems like they recognize that we're going to go to a certain point and then just photograph and then they go back to grazing and whatnot. Yeah, I could sense that today. And, and I could sense that, um, you know, they trusted that you were not going to come too close. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's nice to photograph and videotape them in their natural environment, what they would normally do if we weren't there. The work that you're doing by photographing and telling their story is so important. Have you ever had any close calls? A lot of slip, trip and falls. I think we've all fallen out there. Of course, the rattlesnakes between the crevices. We've had uh, rattlesnake scares. We were stalking a band that we thought was really, really wild. And we quit paying attention to the, the area. And of course we had probably a three foot rattler, two feet in front of us that was not happy that we were there. I was excited that we had this rattler um, and I wanted to take a picture. And so I bet my camera was too big. My lens was too big. So I was backing up and I tripped over a boulder and that just made her mad. <laughs> so her rattle went even more nuts and I was sure I was, I was going to be struck and luckily she just chose to go back into the into the den. My dad, he said, you're your only hero out here. You are. You can't rely on a police department or a sheriff or luckily we have nearby ranchers that said anything you ever need. Just let us know when you're out in the middle of nowhere. It's very possible that you won't be found and you just got to take care of yourself and have that means mountain lion are out here that um, that we know of. That's the biggest predator. And uh, sometimes even wear my sunglasses on the back of my hat. So I learned that from another trail person. The mountain lion stalk, and they stalk from the back for the element of surprise. Like a young cougar will see that, and he'll probably think twice because he doesn't feel like he, it's a surprise element. So that's definitely something that I've done besides a lot of 360s. Sometimes there's areas where you can feel the, the hair stand up because you know you're being watched around a, a canyon. And you, so you do a lot of 360s and sometimes you just have to you know, make sure that you're ready for anything. It's kind of like um, living with uh, nature and trying to read it for survival as well as the Mustangs, for instance, they'll see and smell or sense anything long before us. So we watch their responses and behaviors and they'll look up and then we'll always look that direction. It's nice to be able to be out in the desert and use these different signals from nature. Photographing the Mustangs gets to um, exercise my creativity, advocate for the Mustangs, and drum up that support through having people understand their behaviors. So there's multiple reasons for doing what I do, along with working to try and have the horses better managed. We're hoping and want more of the monies allocated from taxpayer money to go to fertility control. And yes, uh, currently, they'll probably have to go in every you know year or so to re-inoculate the mares for a certain fertility level and some are already in full when they're in, inoculated with with pzp and they will full healthy 
offspring that following year. It doesn't hurt the offspring. We're hoping that we can keep these horses on the range and keep less out of the long-term holding or worse. My preference is for them to stay free and wild. What's your first memory of an encounter with an animal? My dog, Sugar. What's your favorite name for one of the wild horses? Voodoo. Has there ever been a time where you thought, uh-oh, my animal passion has gone too far? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Who are your heroes? My dad. If a genie were to grant you one wish for the Mustangs, what would it be? Um, manage, proper management on the rangelands. If you could ride one of the wild Mustangs for a day, which one would it be? Shaman. Describe the Mustangs in four to five words. Wild, free, captivating, inspiring. They're the Earth's most incredible creatures. And then the viewers that get to hear your story today, they're going to want to know what they can do to help. What do you suggest? Heroes and Horses is actually one that's near and dear to my heart. They help combat veterans and they also use Mustangs to work with them to deal with any issues that they have. So they're a very good organization to also follow. Fantastic. As far as personally, I have my Facebook MustangMeg.com. I have my videos MustangJourney.com, which is also same as YouTube. Um, slash Mustang Meg. They can support your work by purchasing your images though, correct? Oh yes, yes. My website has uh, mustangwild.com and uh, yes, uh, it kind of keeps me roaming out, out here on these ranges by these uh, image purchases. Thank you. Yeah, we want to keep you roaming. Thank you. <laughs> you bring so much awareness to these amazing creatures. So thank you for everything that you've done. And thank you for your work with the animals down in the Florida area. Really appreciate your, your hard work. I appreciate I really, the truly opportunity do. to be here with you. Just a bucket list item, <laughs> hands down. I'm so glad. <laughs>